chemical and biological warfare have been used for as long as man has waged war in one form or another. But it wasn't until World War I that the world saw a widespread, organized, and scientific approach to these vectors of death. Chemical gases were used to horrific and unpredictable results. These weapons were a part of a desperate arms race that had only developed unproven methods for delivery. They'd proved good enough in a lab, but a windy battlefield could turn a changing breeze into a nightmarish cloud of horrific self-inflicted casualties. Gas weapons were used simultaneously by both sides on several occasions, leading to a World War I death toll of 90,000 by chemical warfare. In 1925 though, after the conclusion of World War I, the Geneva Protocol prohibited the use of chemical and biological weapons in combat. Regardless, the USA, the UK, Canada, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union would all carry on their unethical scientific studies and weapon development in secret as the years marched towards World War II. Of the lot, you might be surprised to know that it was Japan who would stand out in World War II as the nation willing to push the boundaries of science while showing a near indescribable lack of ethical or moral boundaries in the pursuit of weaponizing chemistry and especially biology. My history buffs could argue that the Nazis' human experimentation carried out at the hands of Joseph Mengele might take that rancid cake, but these same people know the man who I'm about to talk about, so shut up, this shit is wild. Shiro Ishii is the man responsible for the Japanese military's enthusiasm for these sciences and the clinical horrors that make up the focal point today. In the early 1920s, 30-year-old Shiro Ishii was an up-and-coming pilot and military doctor serving in the Imperial Japanese Army. Considered a genius among his peers, he advocated wildly for germ warfare as a more cost-effective and efficient means of killing compared to conventional arms and explosives. He began to study the shortcomings of the applications in World War I, as well as collecting information on covert programs of other countries to present his thoughts in the form of a proposal. He got a promotion in 1931 to Senior Army Surgeon 3rd Class while he was preparing this data, and again when he presented it in 1935, this time to Senior Army Surgeon 1st Class. Just like his glowing characteristics, his dark side was also well known. The man was a womanizing drunk who would work odd hours and use any chance he could to embezzle money from the military, but his work was so damn good that he was given a pass. Furthermore, when the Japanese formally adopted the policy of the three alls in World War II, a scorched earth endeavor to kill all, loot all, and burn all, Shiro Ishii's work became more essential to their overall goal than ever. The Japanese concept of exceptionalism was deeply rooted in ideas of racial supremacy. This brainworm of racism was something that they shared with their closest allies, and it was not hard to see how these homogenous cultures could breed a level of out-of-control idealism that could justify almost anything in their small world. Shiro Ishii's presentation of ideas prompted the government to allocate massive amounts of resources to create three secret facilities for the research, testing, and production of chemical and biological weapons. The decision was made to place these in the Japanese-occupied Manchurian region of China, a vast rural region bumping up to the Soviet border. It was a vulnerable area with no military presence. Although not officially at war with China or the Soviet Union, it was agreed that the location was a strategical advantage on both nations. And strategically it paid off, as the Republic of China and the Japanese Empire would officially go to war the following year in 1937, and World War II was right around the corner. Unit 100 was designed for studying and developing methods for livestock contamination. Unit 516 was in charge of the research and development of chemical weapons, and Unit 731, the facility that Shiro Ishii would be selected to personally oversee, developed biological weapons and tested them on prisoners of war. 300 Chinese cottages were torched to make room for the state-of-the-art facility. If Shiro is our antagonist, 731 is our set and setting. Officially, the project and all of its facilities were listed as units of the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department, with 731 taking the official cover of a lumber mill. By 1936, 
Shiroishi had settled into his new home. An expansive and self-sufficient complex, laboratories perfectly designed for his inventively cruel experiments set the unit apart from anything ever before constructed. But the site was also well outfitted with infrastructure and more pedestrian facilities to keep things running like a finely tuned mechanism of data collection and death. It had a prison, a stadium, a shrine, several crematoriums, an airstrip and accompanying air fleet, and the whole thing was run on a dedicated power plant. From the very beginning, it was understood by everybody involved that 731 would be conducting human experimentation on enemy prisoners of war. Not to be confused with enemy soldiers, these were just pedestrians that littered the landscape in any direction. These human test subjects would be plucked indiscriminately from unprotected Chinese villages in the Manchurian landscape and in the nearby Soviet border towns. Unmarked vans would go out, black bag kidnapping subjects, sometimes entire families, and bring them back for non-stop testing. As a way to dehumanize the subjects and promote a productive workplace, the researchers at 731 would refer to the test subjects coming in and out of their labs as logs. A cute little play on their sham lumber mill cover story. Unlike some of the other unethical military facilities of the day that had prisoners liberated at the end of World War II, there was not a single survivor of the work carried out within the walls of 731. Some of the experiments would leave the victims massively deformed, but not dead. They would be nursed back to relative health and recycled into a more lethal experiment until they were dead. The test subjects that came in and out of those doors for years represent a more diverse group than you might think. A decision intentionally made by Iroishi to ensure a diverse and broad set of results for analysis. Rough estimates show about 60% were Chinese, 30% or so were Ruskies, and the rest were mongrels, Koreans, or the occasional Englishmen. Please note that I'm using the word man in reference to humanity here because the Japanese scientists did not discriminate for age, sex, pregnancy status, nothing. Everybody was treated like a lab rat. A witness recalls a three-day-old child dying after being used in experiments. It's hard to quantify the death left in the wake of 731 and the 10 years of operation between 1935 and 1945. Depending who you ask, most estimates range between 3 and 10,000. Others, including former workers at 731, say that that number is in the tens of thousands. These are only estimates of those that were killed at the 731 facility, however, and do not even attempt to calculate the deaths of the innocent victims of the massive field testing, in which an entire village could be wiped out in a single day. And if you consider deaths from the other programs that Iroishi helped establish but did not directly oversee, we're looking at closer to half a million deaths. The studies carried out by Unit 731 under Iroishi's direction were, objectively and strictly scientifically speaking, extremely sound and obsessively documented. The clinically meticulous results-driven testing that was done here is only possible when married with a capable workforce preordained with an unforgiving, sociopathic, idealistic mindset. And Shiroishi had the perfect set of drones. They produced extremely relevant and conclusive results for countless military, medical, and academic inquiries that nobody should take seriously, but we all wonder. It was government-funded morbid curiosity and the following are just some of the tests that were carried out. The Japanese researchers took advantage of the cold climate that they were in and began to study frostbite. This served not to weaponize cold weather, but to learn how to avoid, assess, and treat frostbite of their own military ranks. In the winter, they would take prisoners outside and tie them to a post, leaving a single limb completely exposed. One of the researchers would run outside every so often and toss a bucket of water on the exposed limb until it was determined that frostbite had set in. Their surefire method for testing this was to take a stick and hit it against the exposed limb. If it sounded like they'd struck a wooden plank, the victim was cold enough, and at this point the arm was completely dead and would fall off if not amputated. 
Sometimes they would scale up these frostbite experiments and contain an entire family outside to see how long they could keep each other alive in the freeze, simulating reactions of a group of soldiers. Results didn't translate well though because the families would usually result in a frozen human huddle ball with the smallest person in the center and the largest acting as the outer shell. In order to better understand the limits of what was going to be possible when treating Japanese soldiers with horrific injuries of war, several limb-based experiments were carried out. Circulation was cut off entirely to arms and legs to measure the progression of gangrene until it had taken the limb. Sometimes an arm or a leg would be repeatedly crushed by larger and larger increments of weight until it proved to be a lost cause. Opportunistic experimental limb swapping was also attempted when a subject had lost one of his limbs in a previous experiment. For example, if I had my right arm crushed beyond repair and recognition, they would amputate my left arm and attach it where my right arm used to be. It turned out that this didn't work. No matter how asinine the experiment, measurements and calculations were made at every opportunity. To test the effects of intense pressure on the human body, Unit 731 would lock subjects in a large modified pressure chamber with a viewport for the scientists to observe. Pressure would be gradually increased while changes and effects were documented. The pressure would go up and up until the person was dead. The eyes were said to pop out well before this. Some of the testing that occurred at 731 helped Japan to better understand the effects of several already existing medications and vaccines. Of course, these were already safe drugs with plenty of testing at safe levels, but that's not what 731 was interested in. Test subjects were strapped to chairs and injected with drugs in quantities several hundred times larger than what would be considered a safe amount while doctors observed and took notes. To better understand the effects of germ warfare, prisoners were injected with a lethal biological agent and then studied while strapped on a table. Cholera, anthrax, bubonic plague, syphilis, and even parasites were used in these experiments, sometimes in combination. The victims would thrash and seize while medical professionals scribbled observations in their notepads. Before death could arrive, Vivisections, or live dissections, were performed without anesthetics to study the effects of the body after certain time intervals had elapsed. Organs would be extracted from the victims while they were still alive to be studied and analyzed before being preserved in medical jars. A large gas chamber was on the property with a very unique design. It was made of mostly thick reinforced glass to allow for uninterrupted observation. Victims were placed inside, sometimes alone, sometimes with their entire family, as different gases would be introduced at different levels. Again, the onlooking medical crew observed and took notes about physiological changes like bleeding or seizing. Initially, balloons were experimented with for deployment. But objectively, this seems like a lateral move compared to World War I methodologies left at the will of the wind. But then Shiro Ishii had a breakthrough. Unit 731 produced around 2,000 ceramic bombs from 1937 to 1942 as a means of delivering flea-infested bubonic plague and anthrax from above. The heat created by traditional metal bombs would kill any pathogens on board. But this new means allowed the fleas on board to be flung into the air for hundreds of feet with a much smaller explosion. Field testing of these devices, viewed as essential after the fallout of untested World War I weapons, was carried out by the resident air units, which would carry up to 10 flea bombs. They would fly over an unsuspecting village and drop their payloads on a predetermined and unsuspecting village and any surrounding livestock. The small but repetitive explosions, absent any damage or debris, would bring the simple folk out of their shelters to investigate. The highly weaponized fleas went to work in seconds. As the community would start to feel the effects of their microscopic death set in, a coordinated ground unit would arrive in medical vans. Men in hazmat suits carrying medical gear would approach and round up the village. 
It was their confusion that made them easy to control, but that same confusion would quickly turn to fear as the intentions of their new doctors became clear. Vivisections began immediately to gather information on the immediate impact of the biological agent, but they would stagger their procedures for people and livestock so they could examine the effects on the body over time, one by one, until they had harvested organs from the entire village. Later, it was discovered that just kidnapping and tying the villagers to posts before setting off stationary bombs proved a much more accurate experiment. They also tested conventional and improvised shrapnel-filled bombs in the same manner. Sometimes combining the two ideas, stuffing plague fleas and shrapnel in an improvised bomb, setting it off, and measuring the injuries of the victims tied to post various distances away from the bomb. In 1945, the USA dropped a couple freedom bombs on the island nation and put an end to any thoughts of supremacy pretty quick. The Manchuria region was invaded by Russia, who were hungry for some payback of their own. Once the surrender of the emperor came over the radio speakers at 731, Shiroishi knew nobody was coming to help. He ordered his men to assassinate the remaining prisoners and to begin burning the records that they had worked so hard and sacrificed their humanity to gather. Shiroishi faked his own death like a coward, and the American forces figured it out pretty quick, demanding Japan hand him over. Now completely demoralized, the Emperor obliged. Initially, the Surgeon General denied everything, but when he learned that he would be handed over to the Russians next, he decided that he had some valuable information that he would trade for complete immunity. Unaware of exactly how much of the research was left, America weighed her options. If the deal was rejected, Shiroishi would go to the Russians who wanted that information as well. They would probably just torture the man and then kill him when he asked for immunity and all that good information would go to waste. The USA decided to take that monstrous deal and he turned over a pathetic stack of papers that proved to be almost useless. Still. After having a hand in nearly half a million deaths and with no hand to play at all, he was released. Shiroishi died a free man in 1959. Shiroishi's researchers would share a similar fate fading back into Japanese society to help it rebuild. Many of them climbed to success in the Japanese academia before their own deaths. Only 12 soldiers faced prosecution in the Japanese war crime trials and biological weapons were never even mentioned. Japan refused to acknowledge the nightmares of Unit 731 until 1988, and even then, it didn't come with an apology. And that's Curtains Down on Shiroishi 731. Thank you for checking this out. If you like the short form stuff, let me know. The long stuff's gonna keep on coming, so don't worry about that. If if you like this little dark history lesson, hit that like button below. We're almost to a thousand subscribers, so if you're a fan of my content and you aren't subscribed, it may be the time to do that. Thank you to my patrons who support me through everything I do. We'll see you next time the road shows in town. Bye bye